learning any part of Torah is always good for the soul. To uh, spend some time marinating in holiness is a good thing. And it doesn't mean having some strange experiences. Torah is holiness, and if you dwell on it, you're dwelling in holiness. Any part of Torah. If we understand it, that makes it even more pleasurable. And if it's really exciting, well... Now, one of the things we've been doing is showing how Rambam, whose halachic writing is very logical, very systematic, kind of philosophical, but hardly spiritual. Because although Rambam probably was a mystic and studied Kabbalah, in those days, in his times, not everyone revealed the fact that he was studying Kabbalah. But a person like Rambam, it would almost be impossible to believe that he would leave any part of Torah unstudied. And since Kabbalah is a part of Torah, there's no question that he must have studied the Kabbalah. And if he studied it, then it must have influenced his writings, even though he hides it well. And so we've seen on a number of occasions where, in fact, Rambam's opinion or Rambam's position on given laws in Torah actually reflects the Kabbalistic spiritual uh, dimension. Let's try it tonight. This is absolutely fascinating. The Alter Rebbe in Hasidic philosophy says on the portions of the Torah that, we're, that we read about uh, leprosy, the unholiness of it and the cure for it, how it's cured and how it's fixed and so on. Concerning leprosy, called tsaras in Torah, the Torah says, Adam ki yihye If a man will have a spot on his skin. The al Rebbe says, there are four words in Torah used to refer to man, to a person. There's Adam, there is Ish, there is Gever, and there is Enosh. So if you want to say people, men, you can say Adam, you can say Ish, you can say Gever, you can say Enosh or Anoshim. What do these four titles represent? The weakest and the lowest human condition is called Enosh. And that's why the word also means weak. It means a person is composed of intelligence and emotion. But a person who's called Enosh is weak both in intelligence and in emotions. And that's why when the angels didn't want to join God in creating man, we see an interesting thing. God said, Na se Adam bitsalmenu. Let us make Adam in our image. The angels said, Mo enish. What is man? Why would you want to create him? The angels didn't use the same word that God used. God used Adam. The angels said enish. Because the angels were trying to bring out the weakness in the human being, which is why they didn't approve of creating human beings. So enish means weakness in intelligence and in emotion. Gever means strong, like gibor. So gever is someone who is strong in intelligence or in emotions. Strong character or strong mind. Ish represents emotions. Adam represents intelligence. So Adam means an intelligent human being. Ish means a person with emotion, with good emotion or strong emotion. Gever means strong in both, Enish means weak in both. So the highest title of all four is Adam. Adam is a person who is complete, a total mensch, a total human being, or the ultimate human being. Therefore, the Alta Rebbe asks the question, if the Torah wants to talk about somebody who has leprosy, why does he say Adam? If Adam has leprosy, 
you would think a person who is complete wouldn't have leprosy. The answer is, what causes leprosy, at least in biblical times, was the sin of Lashon Hara, speaking evil. The point of it is that a person who is complete, a total mensch, a perfect human being, is not going to get sick internally because he's a solid human being. If he's going to get sick, it'll only be external, on the surface. So his sin, if any, is that he speaks badly. And since speech is an external garment, not necessarily a reflection of the inner person, that's why he is capable of sinning in speech, and that's why his punishment will be only a skin condition, only on the surface, only superficially. That's what the Alta Rebbe says. Rambam says, and if you have, if you have this, this page, page Pei Aleph, if you want to follow in Hebrew, I'll read it and translate. The sage has said, there are three sins for which a person is punished both in this world and in the world to come. There's murder, there's idolatry, there's adultery, and speaking evil is worse than all three. The sage has also said, anyone who speaks evilly is as if he denies the existence of God. As it says in Tehillim, in the psalm, it says, Asher Omru, those evil people who say, Lusheneinu Nagbir, our tongue, our, our speech is powerful, Swaseinu Itanu, we speak as we wish, Mi Odin Lanu, who is our master to tell us otherwise? In other words, the evil speech is similar to denying God's existence. The sage has also said that speaking evilly kills or harms three people. The one who says it, the one who hears it and accepts it, and of course, the one about whom it is said. And the one who hears it is the worst. Okay, that's in one part of Rambam. The question now becomes, the Alta Rebbe says that an Adam can get leprosy because although he's a complete mensch, leprosy is only a superficial condition. It only comes from speaking badly, which is an external thing. Well, Rambam seems to disagree with that very strongly. Rambam is saying, this is no mere superficial sin. This is like idolatry. It's like adultery. It's like murder. It's worse. It's like denying God altogether. So they don't seem to be agreeing on the nature of this particular sin. Now, in another place, in actually in the laws of leprosy, here's what Rambam writes. The word saras in Torah is a very general term describing all sorts of skin conditions. It is used to describe a whiteness in the skin. It is also used to describe a loss of hair. It is also used to describe a change in one's garments and in the walls of the house. Because in the olden days, they would develop this spot on the wall of the house and the whole house would become unclean. You would have to knock out that whole portion of the wall and re... re uh, I don't know what they used in those days. Whatever they used to make walls with. And then it would also happen in the garments of the, furn the uh, leather of the furniture and in the garments that a person wears. All of these things are called saras, so the word is very uh, difficult to define. And he concludes, these changes that take place in the houses and in the garments which Torah calls taras, is not a natural phenomenon. Rather, it is a sign from God that warns the Jewish people to be careful with how they speak. Because if a person speaks badly, the walls of the house are going to change. If he corrects himself and stops speaking badly, then the house will become clean. If he continues to speak badly, even after the house has been uh, declared unfit, then the material, the leather of his furniture, 
will, that he sits on or sleeps on, will develop spots. Again, if he repents, then he's fine, but if not, then the garments that he's wearing will develop spots. And if he still doesn't get better and continues, then his skin will start to show spots. In other words, since speech is an external garment, if you speak badly, what's going to be affected are the garments in your life. What are the garments in your life? The most distant garment is your house. It's like the turtle's garment. It's his house and he also wears it. That is the most distant of garments. That's why it is affected first. The next garment are the materials, the, the cloth or the leather of your furniture. A step closer to you is the garment you actually wear on your skin. Of course, the closest garment physically is your skin. So Rambam says this is how it develops. And it develops as an unnatural sign from heaven to warn us to uh, correct our ways and to speak well. But Rambam uses some interesting words. When a person becomes leprous, everybody knows. And he is forced to live outside of town. He's uh, quarantined, even though it is not an infectious disease. He's quarantined to make a symbol out of him, to make people notice, and to separate him from others. In other words, if you can't speak nicely, then you can't live among people. So what this is supposed to tell us is that we should avoid speaking badly, and he calls it sichas harishoyim, the talk of the wicked, which is mocking and evil talk. Where do we learn this from? We learn it from the story with Miriam. When Moses came off the mountain, when Moshe came off the mountain after having spent 40 days and 40 nights with God, he could not get back into normal living. And so he did not resume relations with his wife. Miriam was critical of that. And she said, we also spoke to God, we meaning Miriam and Aaron, other prophets spoke to God, Abraham spoke to God, and they didn't separate from their wives. What's wrong with you? And because she spoke badly of Moshe, she became leprous. So we see from this that leprosy comes for speaking badly. Now what it tells us is that, listen to this, Miriam certainly was not being vicious she was his older sister who stood by him when he was placed into the, uh, into the basket and placed into the Nile. She raised him practically. She endangered her life to save him. She wasn't really trying to make him look bad. She simply made a mistake by comparing him to other prophets. And that's why God came along and said, who are you talking about? Are you talking about Moshe? He's different. He's the most trusted member of my house. He's not like other prophets. So she made a mistake. Also, Moshe didn't feel bad about it. He wasn't hurt by it. He wasn't offended by it. Because it says Moshe was the most humble of all people. So you would think that evil talk is only when there's evil intention on the part of the speaker and when there is damage to the person spoken of. In this case, there was neither. And yet... She was punished with leprosy. So how much more so these wicked, foolish people who speak too much and boast and talk about great things that they know nothing about. Therefore, anyone who wants to live correctly should avoid joining them and sitting with them lest you get caught up in the web of their foolishness. And this is what they do, these wicked people. First, they speak too much. Nonsense. They talk nonsense. From the nonsense, they start to tell, to uh, speak disrespectfully of the righteous. After that, they get into the habit of questioning or doubting the words of the prophets. 
And from that, they eventually speak against God and start and lose their faith completely. This is the nature of the wicked speech, the wicked talk, that causes them to sit around in the street corners. Eventually, they sit in bars and they get drunk. But the conversation or the talk of those who are righteous and who are proper are only in word, in conversation or talk of Torah and wisdom. And for this, they are rewarded. Now, the question here is this. Rambam says in the other section about evil talk that it is worse than murder and idolatry and adultery. Here, Rambam keeps saying it's foolish talk. And what's wrong with it is that it will lead eventually to a disbelief in God, to a loss of faith. In the earlier section, he says, speaking Lush and Hara is denying God's existence. Here he's saying it might lead to it. And he calls it foolish talk. What's foolish about Lush and Hara? If it's worse than murder, idolatry, and adultery. Now, the commentaries are all over the place trying to reconcile these, uh, these differences. But the Rebbe came up with a brilliant insight into what Rambam is really saying here. It goes something like this. What is wrong with evil talk? What is wrong with evil talk is that if a person has some evil feelings, jealousy, hatred, envy, if he doesn't speak it, if he doesn't bring it out into words, it remains only a feeling. It's a sign that there is something wrong with him internally. But if he doesn't bring it out, either in action or even in speech, then that feeling is not embodied. It's like a spirit without a body. By putting it into words, you're taking this evil energy, this evil character, and you're giving it body. And that's very destructive. Because if it doesn't have a body, then it's your personal problem. Once you give it a body, then it starts affecting other people and it starts hurting other people. So Lush and Hara means giving words, giving body to your ugliest, nastiest, emotions. We should refrain from Lush and Hara because our negative characteristics, our bad traits, don't deserve to be embodied, don't deserve to be expressed. They need to be dismissed, not embodied. Concerning this kind of Lush and Hara, Rambam writes in the earlier chapter that this is worse than murder and idolatry and adultery because this will destroy everything. It destroys you, it destroys the person you're talking about, it destroys the person who's listening. Because you're making evil concrete. In other words, this is the effect that speech, that bad emotions have on your speech. If you don't control the emotion, it will eventually come out in speech, it will eventually come out in action. So it's evil talk, that is the result or the byproduct of evil intention. There's another kind of negative talk, and this works backwards. Our emotions, obviously, are going to inform our speech. The way you talk is going to reflect what you're feeling inside. But it works the other way as well. The way you talk is going to affect your thinking and your opinions, and your personality. In the first chapter where Rambam is talking about the evils of Lush and Hara, he's talking about giving expression to evil emotions. In the laws of Tsaras, in the laws of leprosy, Rambam is not describing evil talk. This is not its place. Here he's simply describing how Tsaras comes about. So he seems to be getting off on a tangent, ranting about all these wicked people, and they sit around and they talk. This is out of place. 
I got a little carried away here. They sit around and they talk foolish and then they talk about this and they talk about that and then they go to bars and they get drunk. I mean, what? we're talking about the laws of leprosy. Don't get carried away. He's not. What he's telling you is this. Leprosy is a sign from heaven to tell us to speak correctly. Now, we don't find every time a person sins that there's a special sign from heaven to tell us not to do it. So if we're talking about the sin of evil talk, of slander and gossip, and that's what the leprosy is coming to tell us not to do, well, if somebody works on Shabbos, there should be some sign from heaven to tell him to stop. A person eats non-kosher food, he should get a sign from heaven to tell him to stop. Why is Lush and Hara the only sin which God sends us a sign? So Rambam says it's not the sin of Lush and Hara. That's a different subject. That's an evil person expressing evil thoughts and evil intentions. For that, you don't get signs from heaven. For that, you get whipped. <laughs> That's a sin. What happens with the leprosy is not a person who has evil feelings and lets them out. On the contrary, it's a person who inside is fine. He has no evil intentions, just like Miriam. And he's not harming anybody, just like Miriam. And yet God sent the leprosy to say, watch your tongue. Because we're not talking here about the classical, conventional lush and hara, which means slander or gossip. We're talking here about reckless speech. And that's why Rambam has to explain it. He says it all begins with just talking too much. About what? Foolish stuff. Nothing evil. Just foolish. That's what we need to have a sign from heaven. God never told us thou shalt not. So if we do, God sends a sign. Be careful. Watch where this leads. Where does it lead? Well, after the foolishness, then you start being critical of those people who are smarter than you because your tongue is just carrying on, doesn't know where to stop. Eventually, you start to criticize or question the prophets. And then eventually, you don't know whether you believe in God anymore because you've talked yourself into a trap. You never even meant it in the first place. So here we're not talking about evil things being expressed in speech. Here we're talking about nonsense speech and how it can affect you internally. So as it turns out, Rambam and the al Rebbe are saying the same thing. The al Rebbe says they are called, these people who get leprosy, are called Adam because they are completely solid human beings. Their problem is only external. But we ask the question, speaking Lashonahara is not external. It's evil. The answer is, we're not talking about that kind of Lashonahara. Of course that's evil. And that's not the guy who gets the leprosy. The guy who gets the leprosy is the guy who starts off talking foolish. Why? Because internally, he has no jealousy, he has no evil feelings, he has no, no critical thoughts about other people. He's just talking. So he's an Adam, but he's got to watch what he says. Because foolish, nonsense talk can have a very bad effect. It seems innocent. With this, the al explains why we don't get leprosy anymore this kind of leprosy. Why don't we get leprosy? Because leprosy is only for people who are healthy on the inside. We're not healthy on the inside. We have more serious problems. <laughs> so back in those days, in those utopian days, when people lived in Israel under the, 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 with, the, with the Kayin Gadol and the temple and the pilgrimages and the sacrifices, what kind of sins were they capable of? Well, it was all external, and so they developed these tsaras signs. I think leprosy today is a much more serious condition. It's not just on the skin. So 
it's not the same. Now comes another question, and this is really an amazing question. If a person really is such a mensch, why would he even engage in such foolish talk? And why does it take a Kohen to purify him? He becomes impure, and he cannot be purified by himself. He has to go to the Kohen, and the Kohen has to declare him purified. If he is an Adam, if he's such a mensch, why can't he correct himself? He realizes he's doing something wrong. He fixes it. That's a mensch. So once he gets the sign, which reminds him that he's not speaking correctly, he should be able to fix it himself. But he can't. He has to go to the Kohen. Why is that? So to this, the Rebbe says, there is this thing called emikra. A person can be perfect, a total mensch, on the conscious level. But you never know what's going on under the surface. So even the biggest chacham may not know what's going on under the surface because his mind can't take him there. So as much as he is a chacham and as much as he is an adam and a mensch, he can't know all that lies beneath. This talk is a subtle expression of that hidden evil unconscious. And when it comes to the unconscious evil, you can't fix it yourself. You need somebody more powerful. It might even be that this hidden evil is inherited. It's not a thought you suppressed. That's not the same thing. The thought you suppressed was once conscious. It's barely hidden. It's just beneath the surface. A Chacham should be able to deal with that too. We're talking here about a really buried evil. Not buried by the person. Buried at birth. Because it's an inherited evil. Something similar to um, the sacrifice that a mother, a new mother, has to bring after giving birth. A sacrifice. And she has to be forgiven. And the question is, forgiven for what? She just had a baby. Why does she need forgiveness? So some people say it's because every woman in labor takes a vow that she'll never have another baby. And, and since that vow is, uh, is not going to be kept, so she has to bring a sacrifice and be forgiven for taking a, a vow in vain or for violating her vow. But that's not the... Uh, the reason she has to bring a sacrifice and be forgiven is that she needs to be forgiven for Eve eating from the tree of knowledge. Why does a woman have pain in giving birth? Because of the effects of the tree. So as long as women are still having pain, it means that that sin is not yet completely erased. So when she has the child, she brings a sacrifice for the sin of, of Chava, of eating from the tree of knowledge. Now that kind of buried sinfulness, you cannot fix by yourself. It's not yours to fix. It's inherited. It's a miasm. And that, you need a higher power to be able to fix that. And so you have to go to the Kohen. What we see from this is that Rambam, although he speaks in such simple, logical terms, was really very aware of all of these mystical considerations. On a practical level, what are the ill effects of careless speech? I was once doing some marriage counseling. The couple were intermarried. He was from Russia and she was from, from New York. <laughs> They were both Jewish, they were both religious, they were both Hasidic, and they're not getting along. So I listened to them complain, and it struck me what their problem was. He was very upset with her. He was Russian. He was very upset with her because she had said something. She says, that's not what I meant. I was, I was just thinking out loud. 
He said, no, that's what you said. Now, why would you say something like that if you didn't mean it? And she says, but I didn't mean it. I was just talking. He says, no. There's something, something you're, not, you're not admitting to because when you said that, it indicated that you... I realize this is a difference in culture. In Russia, you watch what you say. If you say something, it must be on your mind. You must have given it a lot of thought. It must be such a strong feeling, you can't control it. Americans, on the other hand, <laughs> if we ever mean what we say, we're shocked. It's like, oh, you're serious. Oh, what an occasion. That's why we say, no, I mean it. Americans have to say that. Because if you don't say that, then you probably don't mean it. <laughs> it's a horrible expression. Okay, I'll tell you the truth. Right? What, until now you've been lying? <laughs> to tell you the truth, why do we keep saying that? And it's gone so bad that even when we say to tell you the truth, it's not the truth. We were just talking. <laughs> Eventually, it gets to be even worse. You say you're angry. You're not really angry. No, two days later, somebody says to you, so what were you so angry about? I wasn't angry. No, I was, no, I was nothing. <laughs> you, do you know when you're angry? Are you ever angry? For real? Then it gets really scary. You say you love somebody. Two days later, somebody says, so you really love that person? And you say, what? No. Did I say that? No, I was just talking. This is scary stuff. This is the effect of careless talk. Not malicious, not evil. Just talk. The nature of talk is itself negative. So unless you invest meaning into words, words are bad. And that's why the Mishnah says, there is nothing healthier than silence. Meaning to say, by its very nature, talking is a bad thing. Because it's a garment with no one wearing it. So unless you invest it with some personality... It's a garment. It's a shmata. And to talk about garments, it's nonsense. So children need to be taught. Babbling is not cute. And it's not harmless. So when a child says, oh, I was just joking, I didn't mean it, this is not a good habit. I mean, if it's a good joke, okay. But the habit of it of saying things without meaning it. This is very dangerous, actually. And this is what leads to this widespread malady, the chutzpah that children have. They have a respect for nobody. They'll question everything and everyone, whether they know what they're talking about or not. It's just the way their mouth works, not their mind. But eventually, it starts to affect your mind. It starts to affect your beliefs. It starts to... People start questioning fundamental truths. So you say to a child, you're going to fall down and hurt yourself. The child says, oh no. Oh no? Oh yes, you're going to fall and hurt yourself. Don't touch that, it's hot. Oh no. This is dangerous. The Torah says that uh, you have to eat matzah on Pesach. Kids say, ah, I don't think so. <laughs> you, don't, you don't think so? How do we get that way? How do we get to where a 16-year-old has an opinion about God's existence? Their own opinion, which we're supposed to respect because it's their own. How does a 16-year-old get an opinion about God? One way or the other. Now somebody asked me, do you think there's a God? Do you believe there's a God? 
I said, how am I supposed to know? What are you asking me? How am I, do, what do I look like? <laughs> I'm supposed to know whether there's a God? Or even worse. You think God cares about this or the other? No, I don't think so. Is that an educated guess? What is that? <laughs> oh, yeah, I think he cares a lot. Well, where do you get an opinion one way or the other? This comes from talking too much. That's what Rambam says. They start off talking nonsense. Then they become experts at everything. <laughs> this is the effect of living on the external edge. There doesn't have to be any content behind what you say. So if you say, oh, there is no God, and if there is, okay, so there is. In other words, there's no, there's no substance to your words. So why not? Yeah, have an opinion about this, that, the other, why not? You might be wrong, <laughs> so I'm wrong. Who cares? I didn't really mean it in the first place. We were just talking. <laughs> So even at a young age, children have to be encouraged to be a little more thoughtful, not so wordy. And that's what leprosy comes from. Not from being evil and talking nasty about people. For that, you get whipped. Not a sign from heaven. You don't deserve a sign from heaven. But if you're basically a good person and you need to be reminded that your own words can be your worst enemy, for that they used to get a sign from heaven. But now that we have more serious problems, those signs don't come anymore. But we could eliminate many of our problems by being more, more thoughtful, or what they call today mindful, more mindful in our, in our talk, in our speech. That way, when a person says something, you know that they mean it. When a child says he's got a problem, it's a problem, not belly aching. When a child says he wants something, he really wants it. He's not just being difficult. But if a, if a child is in the habit of talking, you never know what you're dealing with. Is he just saying it? Does he really mean it? Is that really, it becomes very, uh, very messy. What do you think? <laughs>